we're talking about equitable streets today, and we know that streets are more than just places to move cars. They're also ways to engage people uh, in um, equitable um, participation in the public space. And this is an issue that we've been working on since Sustained Charlotte was founded 10 years ago, but it's more timely than ever. Streets are really our largest uh, shared public space. And even though we may not all live near a park or near a greenway, we pretty much all live near a street. So these are spaces that we can all improve. And the difference between a space and a place is when you say the word space, we just think about it kind of being a void. It's the, it's the absence of, of uh, liveliness. But a place is really, it's a space that has elements of human interaction. So that's what we're really focusing on today is how to make streets as spaces into places where people can interact. And as our community considers how to use streets as a true community asset, we're really grateful to have the leadership of our city really deeply engaged in looking at best practices and piloting some new ways that our streets can do a lot more than, than just move cars. And we're really honored to be joined this afternoon by Taiwo Jaioba and Julie Isol. And I'll introduce both, both of them as they speak. They both shared their preference for just going on a first name basis this, uh, this afternoon, so we'll keep it pretty casual. So I first would like to introduce Taiwo Jaioba. He is our assistant city manager, as well as director of planning, design, and development. And he brings nearly 30 years of experience uh, in the private sector, regional, and municipal service. And he comes to us from the Sacramento Regional Transit District in California. And he also served as director of planning and development in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And in both cities, he led and managed major federally funded transit studies, zoning ordinance rewrites, and large scale capital projects. And we're really excited to have Taiwo with us this afternoon because he is, he is one of the uniting human factors in virtually all of the city of Charlotte's transportation and land, uh, land use planning efforts. I was at a series of virtual meetings a few weeks ago where I, I saw Taiwo speaking three days in a row, first at the the City Council Transportation Planning Environment Committee meeting, and then the next night at the Charlotte Moves Task Force meeting, and then the following evening at the Metropolitan uh, Transit Commission meeting. So he, he really does have um, the, the best interests of our, our city at heart as he works on so many of these efforts together. So at this point, I will turn the presentation over to Taiwo to talk to you more about what the city is doing to advance equitable streets. Thank you so much, Meg. Um, that was a very kind introduction. I appreciate that. I hope all of you can hear me. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you and then uh, walk you through a uh, presentation. Okay. Um, hopefully this works the way we envisioned it. Um, yeah, so that's it. The state of our street, and that's kind of where we start from. So first of all, again, uh, good evening. It's definitely a perfect timing to be having this conversation. Some of you already heard the news that uh, our city, we've closed a uh, triumph between 3rd and 4th Street uh, to uh, traffic through the end of September. And um, we'll see what our future holds for that block, but definitely our city is um, changing and, uh, and for the better. But today, as you can see on that screen, about 80% of um, Charlottians drive to work alone. For a growing city, that's not healthy uh, for us, and it's definitely not the way we want to go. And yet, because 80% of our, our people really think that our streets should be designed for non-auto-centric uses, uh, such as walking, biking, and transit, probably if we had scooters to that, that percentage might actually uh, go slightly up. Um, in an environment where a quarter of a million Charlotteans don't drive, uh, that's um, definitely a latent opportunity for us to move people from driving to using other means of, uh, you know, automobile, other means of transportation. So the pandemic, uh, obviously very tragic, and then the national racial uh, injustice and arrests that we have had, uh, as they, they've both created opportunities for us uh, to, they both created opportunities for us as a growing city 
to see how we can reimagine our streets as a valuable asset and definitely use them in a more uh, auto-centric manner. Let me see if I can actually uh, share this screen with you properly so you don't get to see all the um, information that I have there. But um, if not, then we just, we just keep going. Um, well, so in May, we launched three initiatives. And I start with the first one, which is at the shared street. Uh, in communities where streets were closed uh, to, through traffic, but then still allow people to use the streets for running, for biking, for walking, uh, you know, and, and still be able to maintain the six feet uh, physical distance. We're in the second phase of that right now, and so far almost 70% of people that we surveyed felt that it has been uh, successful. Uh, the second one is our outdoor dining uh, program, which we also launched um, back in June. And um, right now we have about 16 different businesses that have registered citywide. I'd like to see more. Uh, as of July 6, we've got about 16 uh, that we're working with. Uh, so we, we want this to just be as successful as the shared streets have been. It allows restaurants to use parking spaces uh, to use the extra sidewalks that they may have, or even the streets uh, for temporary outdoor dining experience. And it also helps us to maintain the six feet physical uh, distancing. And of course, the murals, uh, the mural program, just in the last month of July, of June rather, we've had you know, 15 different murals installed in 15 different neighborhoods in Charlotte, um, six of them on shared streets. We definitely wanna make sure that we continue to not only open streets for people to share them, but also how could you make these streets vibrant and attractive. The most popular of them, obviously, is a Black Lives Matter mural on Triumph between 3rd and 4th. This was envisioned uh, via a tweet on June 5th. And before you knew it, at uh, June 9th, we had installed it. So June 12th, we closed the street. Had to imagine that a month ago uh, was when this all started. If you had said to me five months ago that we would be at this spot, I would have said I'm not so sure uh, about that. The Tryon Street mural definitely um, has really captivated the attention of our community. It's provided a place where we can really um, engage community, foster interactions, really make sure that uh, people can, can safely uh, stay in that space over the next several weeks as we close it through the end of, um, of September. Of course, it was all made possible because of the uh, grants, I uh, won $65,000 thanks to uh, Manager Jones and uh, Mayor and Mayor Pro Tem and Council uh, for approving that as part of the last two years budget. Uh, this, this fiscal year budget as well, we've got uh, good money uh, in, in that budget that would also go towards our placemaking. And then, of course, I really want to give a shout out to our placemaking hub uh, that's uh, been led by Monica Holmes at the city for the very good work that they are doing when it comes to partnering with community members, uh, residents, to turn them into placemakers, to, so, so to speak. So you, you really don't have to be a planner to make a place. Whether you wrap a signal box with a beautiful design or give us ideas as to how can we convert bus stops or bus shelters or streets into a very vibrant and, and uh, thriving experience makes a lot of difference. Well, what exactly does this look like? All of these things that I've talked about are projects or programs. Are, what are we envisioning and as a city going into the future? You've all heard about a comprehensive plan, so I'll start with that and then I'll go to our center city all in plan. There are 10 big ideas that we're looking at right now as part of our comprehensive plan. And I'm happy to say that a lot of them really focus on creating equitable streets, reimagining the way that we talk about transportation, mobility in our city uh, right now. So it envisions that what we see now, whether they be shared streets or outdoor dining or murals or engaging artists in making places, become really part of our future as a city. Whether it's talking about balanced mobility, of creating 10 minute communities or healthy and active communities. The emphasis is really about getting people to interact rather than driving. So our future should be focused on pedestrian activities, 
William Shakespeare, some of you might have heard me quote him when he said, what is the city but the people? And it's really about people. And that's really what our future should be about. This is exciting for me. When I think about our center city, all in 2040 plan, there's nine focus areas. And one of those focus areas is really Tryon Street. How can we envision Tryon Street to be active for pedestrian activities, 365 days a year, 24 seven? Um, what if we could connect uptown destinations with vibrant active street like Brevard Street? How can we turn East Trade Civic Center into a place where people don't feel that they have to run for their lives when they are crossing the street, but really see that as an opportunity to uh, engage the community uh, in, in that process? All of these are plans, they are policies, but this is where they begin to become reality. This is the type of future we should envision for Charlotte, uh, where it's a complete street. It's not only where people would drive their vehicles, but whether you are on a motorbike or you are on a bicycle, or you just wanna sit outside the building and have dinner or have lunch or hang out with your friends, and you feel that you can do it safely and still be able to cross the street safely. Our Unified Development Ordinance is having a very robust conversation around this right now, that it's not just enough for us to um, talk about this in policies, but how do we make sure that our sidewalks are, are wide enough, especially in urbanized areas, that not only can you accommodate trees, but you can also accommodate bicycle riders, you can accommodate pedestrians, you can accommodate people who want to dine out or, you know, and have experience outside there, people want to use transit. And our Charlotte Moves Task Force is really focused on that as well, and that's very important. This is the task force that Mayor Lyles um, initiated back in February of this year to focus on mobility. And it's not just about driving, but it's also about you know, transit, it's about you know, uptown, uptown cycle links, extending that. Uh, it's about trails, it's about transit. And, and the scale has to be such um, of such magnitude that it can be transformational for Charlotte, but it also has to be one that will remove barriers. It also has to be one that will begin to shift that mode uh, uh, use. Remember at the very beginning, I said almost 80% of our people in, in our community drive to work alone. We need to have a transformational mobility network that reduces that 76.6% significantly down in a way where you can have whether van pooling or car pooling or using transit or biking to work, making sure that our streets are done in such an equitable and balanced manner. We're not the first to do this. Um, as small cities have been converted into streets to plazas, what they are finding is that these streets conversions actually support local businesses, they foster neighborhood interactions, they actually enhance pedestrian safety, they encourage non-motorized transportation, and they do reimagine the potential of city streets. So as we reimagine the future of Tryon, I wanna share three streets with you that converted to plazas. And you know, one of them obviously is Lincoln Road in Miami, about three blocks. Think about it, that Tryon Street between, um, between I believe between Trade and um, Third or so, it's roughly about eight blocks. So if we have, to, we can create an eight block plaza on Tryon Street actually, an average block length is about 400 feet and distance between facades is about 92. So something similar. To, to what we have in Lincoln Road, Miami, and it was done in 1960. It has succeeded even while other plazas have failed. This succeeded because not only did they close this and allow pedestrians to use this, they also had amenities that would serve people, that would serve pedestrians. So it succeeded and it has survived. The third one, of course, is in Santa Monica. Um, it's slightly um, you know, smaller in terms of three blocks, but it's also become very active and very successful. You activate the street and allow people to really do a lot of good things uh, and along that corridor. And of course, a very popular one is uh, Times Square in New York. Uh, I just wanted to show the before and after. Uh, some of us know only the after, but we've never seen the, the picture of the before. But that's what it used to be like until it was converted to what you see after. So it is possible. It is, we can reimagine our streets in such a way that it's possible that they focus on people and people activities rather than the automobile. 
So what's next for us? I like to say that what's next for us is that we need to build on our current successes as, as, as a city. Uh, what we've done right now, whether it's 74 open streets or the festivals we've had in the past on, uh, on, um, um, in, in South End, or even what we have right now on, on uh, Tryon Street as well in terms of closure. We also need to leverage the current budget allocation, and you can see those numbers there again, thanks to Mayor Pro Tem and, and Council for really moving this forward for us, uh, whether it's investment in our corridors, whether it's investment in our sidewalks and pedestrian safety, we need to leverage those. We need to make sure that our voices are heard that can help to move this forward. But I also, you know, the reason why I put this picture of street fight there is this, I, I, what I call mobility managers. We have tree arborists at the city. People, you know, like to talk to the tree arborists. Why don't we have street fighters? People who are passionate about fighting for what's right on our streets. A mobility manager, people who can cross the line between transit to walking, to biking, to automobile. Uh, you know, how do we make sure that maybe in the future this is a type of thing that we do? And then partnership with groups like Sustain Charlotte, uh, partnership with other agencies, the county, uh, center city partner. That, that's really made what we have on Tryon Street today a possibility. But also it's the fact that we have to embrace change. Change is not an easy thing to have. You know, Tryon has been in existence for like 200 and some years. And all of a sudden, we're talking about this. But that conversation needs to be had. Uh, we need to start talking about how do we make this shift. It's going to have to be not just something that policymakers like myself or elected officials like Mayor Pro Tem will have to do by ourselves. We need that partnership. And we also have to make sure that as we talk about this, it's change that we have to embrace, all of us, whether the residents or the business owners or the people only come there to work or just visit us you know, to these streets. We've got to embrace change and understand that unless we do, it will be very hard to pull this off. So I really want to thank you very much again for uh, inviting me to, to share our vision and where we're taking this uh, in the future. Definitely the pandemic has been tragic. George Floyd's death was also very tragic. But somehow we've been able to see how can we maximize these moments that have become movements. How can we make sure that we continue to open up environments where people can equitably participate in shaping and building our city. So thank you very much. I will turn it over back to you. Thank you so much, Taiwo, for sharing that fantastic information. We love seeing the examples from Santa Monica, Miami, New York, and we love seeing the changes already on the ground here in Charlotte. So thank you so much for your leadership, and we continue to look for great things to happen from the city in, in the coming days and months here in Charlotte. So thank you again. I just wanna take a moment to remind our attendees that if you have any questions for our upcoming question and answer period, you can type those into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And I saw that a few people were asking questions about the presentation. We will be sending that up, sending that out to you as a PDF link in a follow-up email tomorrow. So um, no need to, to try to capture everything right now because we will be following up with that. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Julie Eisel. Julie is the chair of the City Council Transportation Planning and Environment Committee, and she also serves as the Mayor Pro Tem. She is a City Council member at large, which means that she represent, represents all of the residents of Charlotte. Julie first ran successfully for Charlotte City Council in 2015 and is on her third term on council. She chairs not only the Transportation Planning Environment Committee, but she also is vice chair of the Budget and Effectiveness Committee. In 2019, Julie was appointed by Governor Cooper to serve on the North Carolina State Banking Commission and was appointed by North Carolina Transportation Secretary Trogdon to serve on NC First, a state transportation revenue commission. So as you can see, Julie not only has a deep passion, but also a very deep understanding of transportation issues, as well as a very strong commitment to advancing transport, transportation equity. So it's our pleasure to have her here with us this afternoon. And Julie, just to, to kick things off, as chair of the City Council Transportation Planning and Environment Committee, 
Could you just share with us the role of that committee in ensuring that Charlotte streets are truly equitable for all people and how elected officials work with both city staff and the public to implement changes to our streets? Sure, Meg. Um, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you to Sustain Charlotte for organizing this um, event and all the ones like it that you have, have um, brought into everybody's living rooms during this pandemic. So as Taiwo said, change is really hard. I get so excited when I see Taiwo's presentations, as I know we all do, and we say, we want to have that. We want to have Lincoln Road or Santa Monica's Third Street. And then we, figure, we find out how hard it is to actually make that happen. And you guys with Sustain Charlotte are a huge part of what moves us forward. I really appreciate it because having come to this job of an elected official as an advocate first, just a citizen who was advocating for something, I really know how important advocacy is and how powerful it is. You all have a lot of power by using your voices and also educating yourself. So thank you for that. And thank you for coming to our committee meetings because that's where the work gets done. At the, on the city council, at the committee level, is really where the sausage is made. Um, and so that's where we really take some of the policies that we would like to make permanent and to codify and talk through how we can make that happen. I think what's really important right now is when we talk about equitable streets, it's easy to say, I'm all for equitable streets, right? I mean, who wouldn't say that? That's really important because it takes some really bold moves to be able to make our streets more equitable. They, it is important that we have equitable streets because what that means is everybody feels like an uptown Charlotte or a South End or a Ballantyne is a place that they can go. That's what those open equitable streets mean. It means there's something for them there and they have a way to get there. When we did uh, Charlotte Shout last year, the big outdoor out, um, art festival, that pretty much was free. Most of the events were free. Some of them had a little bit to pay. I, we loved sitting, my husband and I remember 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, we're sitting on North Tryon as if it was the Champs-Elysees and watching families walk up and down North Tryon having a blast. It was the most diverse I've seen our city. It definitely was the most diverse I've seen uptown. And so that to me is what equitable streets are all about. A, is that you have the ability to access those streets, and B, there is something there for you. So um, I, I guess just to speak to um, equitable, equi equitable, ah, equitable streets, that's a really important point. But mostly, it's the work that gets done at, count, at the council level, and I really encourage citizens to watch our, com our committee meetings. When we're live, again, you can attend those committee meetings as an observer and you can email us later with concerns, but when you become more knowledgeable about the process is really when you can become the best advocate to get things to happen. Thank you so much, Julie. We have, I see we have over 100 participants on right now listening to those words. And if, if there's one or two things that you could tell them about, maybe, maybe people are ready to take some action, but maybe they've never spoken with their local elected official before, do you have any suggestions for how they could have that first conversation with either their district city council member or an at-large council member sure. like yourself? Yeah, so we do get a lot of emails. So always feel like you can email any council member, but certainly you have one district council member and you have four at-large members. It takes me a few days to, get e to return to all my emails, but I do try to respond to everybody individually unless you cut and paste, and then sometimes those go into junk mail. But it, you know, ask, just ask questions. It's, it is daunting. When I took over this committee, um, I really had spent more of my work on, on uh, public safety. That's why I ran for office. So I really had to try to get up to speed and understand this. And it's very confusing because we have different levels of funding um, that come from the city and from the state and from the federal government. So it is kind of confusing. People wonder why you can't clean up um, the freeway when it doesn't belong to us. So I, I think that's the number one thing. And then the second thing is, again, well, you know, asking questions and then just attending and, and, and finding uh, thought leaders like Jeanette Sedek Khan and certainly Sustain Charlotte. Find people on Twitter and Facebook that you can follow and just learn what other cities are doing. Today I posted a great article that was out of the New York Times 
think I posted it either on Facebook or Twitter um, about what Manhattan is looking at doing, envisioning, really reimagining, could they make New York City car free? And what does that really mean? And, and when you think, oh, that's impossible, because in New York City, contrary, completely opposite to Charlotte, 80% of people in New York City don't use cars to commute. They use public transportation. So if it's hard for them to do, we have to think about the opportunity we have to become a less of a car dependent community. We, can, we have a better chance to do that now when it's still hard to do than we do years from now when we're locked in because we have, um, we've really built for a car centric community, which means um, you're gonna make it much harder to undo that. That's the concept of an induced demand being when you build, when you take your available land and you give cars, uh, give it to cars, you make it more attractive to drive, then you're gonna have to spend more money update, you know, keeping those streets maintained um, and, and you know, you're gonna make it more difficult for cyclists and pedestrians. Absolutely, it's so so critical to have that vision and, and so many cities that had been pretty car centric like New York City and uh, Amsterdam and Copenhagen really took some bold steps to become really people centric and, and the quality of life has improved as a result. So last month we had Scott Curry from Charlotte DOT joining us and he talked about the city's plans to build an uptown cycle link that will connect uptown and also other parts of the city of Charlotte through different projects with protected bike infrastructure and create an all ages, all abilities bike network. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of making sure that uh, our city really invests in safe infrastructure for people who are especially riding bicycles or walking, who, who don't own a car or hurt, who choose to get around by other modes of transportation? Yeah, absolutely. Especially since I broke my elbow on a scooter last month. Um, I'm very concerned about the quality of our infrastructure right now for bikes and scooters and pedestrians. And, you know, a lot of, like, I, like you mentioned, Meg, a lot of cities are making sure that there are barriers between their bike lanes and their car lanes. And especially as we're taking space away from cars, that's even more critical because people are used to having all that space for themselves in their cars. So we've got to be willing to not just paint some stripes on a road and say, now we've got a bike lane. We, you know, you, when you guys um, advocate for the bike lane and for like the cycle Scott, uh, track that Scott's talked about, what's really critical is to follow up and see whether we've done what we said we were gonna do and follow up with the next step of it of putting those barriers in place, putting the signs to help uh, drivers understand any kind of changes in the road system um, and educate people as to how to use them. Absolutely and we we were definitely trying to play that role of Sustain Charlotte of, of making sure that what needs to get done at the the city happens and we know that that can't happen without courageous leadership by people like yourself and, and Taiwo. So thank you again for, for everything that you do. And now we're going to move into our question and answer time. So Sarah Ann, who works here at Sustain Charlotte has been keeping an eye on the question and answer and she'll be asking those questions. And Taiwo and Julie, you can, you can decide who will respond if it's obvious to you who should respond or you can both respond to the questions. Great. Well, our first, attend our first question is from an anonymous attendee. Um, the question is, are there any plans for less advantaged areas of Charlotte? All the examples seem to be in Uptown or in other more well-off areas. I can, I can start with that. Um, good question. So when we were looking at the shared streets concept, we started looking at areas that do not have sidewalks, uh, but we ended up going with certain areas that we could quickly deploy those. And then we opened it for nominations and uh, in order for us to make sure that it was equitable as well. And so when we rolled out the second phase, uh, it was not just about uptown, it was also in other communities as well, outside of um, South Charlotte. But we also, though, when we were launching the 15 murals uh, in 15 neighborhoods, <laughs> Uh, in the month of June, uh, five, six of them were uh, on shared streets 
uh, where we actually installed those murals. And they were not just uptown. I mean, the most prominent one, obviously, is the one you see on Triumph between 3rd and 4th, a Black Lives Matter. But they are all over the city. And, and we plan to continue to do that as well. Great. Thanks, Tywo. Um, speaking of shared streets, we have a question from Brian. He says, the shared streets have been fantastic, but I no longer feel safe using them since the veh vehicular barricades have been removed. Since this is in the pilot stage, will the city consider physical barricades going forward to protect pedestrians from vehicles? Good question, Brian. I'm definitely going to look into that after we're done tonight and make sure that we pedestrian safety is priority. That's why we, we, we are closing down Tryon temporarily. Uh, for the foreseeable future. So the same thing should apply to the shared streets. So I will definitely look into that uh, from tonight and I'll be glad to uh, know, you know, reach out to me uh, at some point uh, so I can at least know what's going on. But I, I will definitely get on that tonight. Great. I think that another, if I can just tag onto that a little bit, I think we've got to look at the, the streets that that have worked well for shared streets aside from North Tryon and put some impediments in those streets, perhaps keep people from cutting through. Um, there's one in particular near me that um, is near one of the hospitals. So it's healthcare workers that are always cutting through on the street um, and can't say much about that right now. But I think if we had planters or something in there that made it obvious that it really was a pedestrian shared street as well, it would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Cam. Um, the question is, will the potential of a permanent plaza and potentially more in the future open up conversations about converting perp perpendicular uptown streets to two-way traffic? Additionally, are we considering solutions that convert parallel parking on Tryon to linear plaza areas while keeping two lanes of traffic open? Barcelona is currently doing similar things as an example. So one of the things that we're going to be doing over the next couple of months uh, while trying um, the block is uh, close to traffic is do some analysis of that block. But this will also require analysis of other uh, uptown streets as well before we can make that decision. And in order for us obviously to do something that large scale, council has to be involved. And, and so we'll have to be a lot of stakeholders involvement because there are people who live on these streets uh, and there are people who have businesses there as well. So mm -hmm. it's not something we can do overnight, but definitely everything is on the table when it comes to making sure that people are given priorities uh, uptown. Uh, so we, we will be doing that analysis, not just for Tryon, but generally uh, for our uptown areas as well, and how can they? How can we make sure that we connect people to the right places and still be able to protect their ability to safely navigate their experiences? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, kind of along those lines, we have another question from an anonymous attendee. Um, the question is: I have several friends who work in uptown on the area where it is shut down for the mural. They are working limited hours after being shut down for three months. Does the city have any plans to help the businesses who are being hurt by the closure? Uh, so I'll tell you that yesterday I had uh, two stakeholders meetings um, with people who live and who also have businesses there. Um, there are folks who actually felt that this has benefited their businesses more than hurt it. Um, there are folks who also felt that, yes, business is good, but the crowd sometimes um, is a little bit intimidating to the people who come to, to eat there. So it's really more about um, having, um, you know, police um, enforcement, but also being very careful and really more about deploying some of our center city partners ambassadors uh, to make sure that people feel comfortable there. So. We, we will be, every decision that we make going forward includes bi-weekly meeting with businesses and residents in that block to make sure that we understand what exactly is impacting your quality of life, how can we address them, and what are those things that are, can also be deployed that will make this experience better, not just for you, but for people who visit this space. So it's a balance that we have to strike but we, we are ready for it. And uh, we definitely believe that having that bi-weekly conversation will help us to address a lot of issues. Great, thank you, Taiwo. 
Um, our next question is from Valerie. She says, is the city working with Charlotte City Center, Center City partners on the CCCP vision plan? If so, how? How do the two vision plans interact? Shouldn't there be a coordinated holistic plan for the vision of Charlotte as a whole? Great, thank you. Great question. Uh, so yes, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, not only is the city working from a planning, um, planning staff to planning staff angle, but the fact is that the city is also actually funding the Center City 24 Division Plan uh, to a degree. So obviously we have a, you know, a major role to play. So it's not just a Center City Plan, it's actually also a city plan. And so there's a lot of connections between these two plans. We, we have meetings almost every week um, where we present together. Uh, they will be pre presenting this to our planning commission on Monday and they presented to um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem's uh, TAP committee last month. And so we're, we're, we're working together. Sometimes you read those two plans right now in the draft phases and you see some common languages there. And that to me is an evidence that we really are affecting what's going on uh, between plans. Will we get it right 100%? I don't know, but as we review it together, we will definitely be finding areas where we make sure that we're not uh, working against each other's intentions. Mm -hmm. Great. Our next question is from John. He says, do you think the long overdue focus on equity and investment in non-auto modes will work its way up to NCDOT? How will you involve them in this funding and implementation discussion? NCDOT funding. Maybe Mayor Protem can help us <laughs> with that and then I can jump in. <laughs> That's, that is a tougher one. And I, I can tell you that, so the NC First Commission that I am on is an, a, um, a commission that was formed by the former secretary, Tro Jim Trogdon, and it is looking at how we're going to pay for the, the state's transportation needs going forward, given the depletion of the highway trust fund dollars. Um, but 50% of what the department's um, funding goes for is road maintenance. And the funding models don't really support pedestrian and, and bike infrastructure. So, um, th you know, that's one conversation we have to have is how the funding formulas work. That said, I think Secretary Jim Trogdon was one of the most forward thinking leaders at the state level that I've heard when it comes to transportation. Uh, we have a new secretary now, and so I don't know what his vision is as much, but um, I, I think that the connection is with when it comes to funding, and it's really important that people understand how we fund our transportation um, projects and, and advocating for a flip of that so that we're putting more funding into greenways and other forms of transportation that ultimately in the end are gonna be cheaper, are gonna be better for the environment, and are gonna get more people where they, where they need to go. Great. Um, our next question is from Leonard. He said, I've seen plans for the Silver Line passing around downtown Charlotte, but I'm a big proponent of having it come right through the downtown area by using a tunnel under the city. There is a proven technology using the Elon Musk Boring Company. I would like to see that plan make it to the front. The cost will be higher initially, but for a true world-class city, this would be a big step forward. Okay. Oh, take that one. <laughs> you want me to take that one? Yes, please. Okay, so um, I don't know if that was a question or a statement, but um, I'll, I'll say that right now, the, the phase of environmental work and engineering that we are on um, is looking at the uh, Brookshire option, um, at least to be able to identify whatever issues may be along that particular corridor. I do get the notion of trying to come on trade and, and do a tunnel, uh, but I'm also being very careful about, you know, you spend so much on that. What exactly is the, um, do you get the, do you get, does it really do anything major for your uptown? I always say to folks, uptown will be always economically successful. And we know that regardless of what happens, we can always make it better. But then there is the north side of triumph that continues to struggle. How can we help to uplift that environment? So once this study is done, uh, at least the current work that we're on right now, I think it will identify for us whether the path that we're on is not you know, uh, feasible. And so the 
trade one, maybe revisit it at that point in time. But right now, uh, that's what we're looking at. And we've also got to consider uh, the way I look at it was that uh, the less than one mile, I think it was 0.9 of a mile uh, for what Nashville was looking for as part of their uh, failed referendum about a year ago was going to cost over a billion dollars. And when they go back right now as to why Nashville lost that referendum, that was one of the reasons they felt that they lost. And so we need to be very, very careful that we don't spend a huge portion uh, of our dollars on um, you know, a, a portion that's not going to really make such a huge or significant difference uh, in the overall scheme of things. Eventually, this will go out to the public for some decision making. And I want to make sure that everybody feels that you are spending the taxpayer dollar on building a transit system that will be very, very successful. So I would like to just add to that too. And I struggled with that notion that we wouldn't be going right through uptown. But one point that was made to me that is valid is that our transit hub, if you will, is going to shift as soon as we get the gateway center open. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna, you know, that the potential for the development around that area as an entertainment district really could shift the whole of what we consider to be kind of the hub of downtown, uptown. Great. Um, our next question is from Martin. He says, Terry Lansdale of Bike Walk NC says that a transportation bill has just been passed by the legislature that is going to hit transit and cycling hard on the funding side. Do you know any particulars, especially how that might affect Charlotte? Yeah, let me have put time start with that also. Um, but I do know that that is true, um, that there is um, a bill that will impact us, uh, but we don't have the whole detail yet as to the extent of that impact uh, on us. So it's something that I'm still kind of looking at, um, but right now it's not determining the extent of that. It's not just on transit and cycling, it's also on our Department of Transportation as well. Uh, so CATS and, and uh, CDOT will be impacted by this, and we just have to take a good look as to the extent of that impact. Yeah, John, I had asked John Lewis that question, and he thought that CATS could stand to lose um, from the state ma maintenance assistance program up to $11 million. It could be that we could get some CARES Act money to replace that funding, um, but he's still trying to the federal government hasn't quite determined whether or not they can allow that to be used uh, for that purpose. Our next question is another anonymous one. Um, the question is, in terms of bicycle or pedestrian commuting, I feel like speeding cars is a big problem. Can there be an effort similar to the 485 effort to slow down speeders? This is a citywide issue. But definitely, that's uh, something that I believe CDOT looks at regularly uh, on streets that we, can, we do have ownership of. Uh, in terms of the, the speed limit. And some of those other streets are owned by NCDOT, uh, and so they set those limits. It will have to be a conversation that we'll have with them um, in terms of um, the, the speed limit. Red light right. camp. <laughs> Uh, we've got a question from John. He says, what tools can the city use to incentivize developers to help fund or work to shift streets to less auto-centric uses, perhaps in zoning ordinances or impact fees? <laughs> uh, um, impact fees, just the, the, the name alone just scares some people. <laughs> I, 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 I look at it more as a community benefit uh, fee, an assessment fee. You know, we're one of the largest cities in the country without something like that. Um, and a recent survey was done by Duncan Associates, I believe it was a 2019 survey that looked at states and cities in the country when it comes to impact fees. Uh, while places like Raleigh, uh, Durham, um, Chatham, they have those in place and they invest them in schools, libraries, and parks. We don't have that, and we consistently rank low when it comes to parks uh, on trust uh, for public, uh, public, public land, um, uh, you know, uh, rating, uh, ranking. And it's not, and every time there's rezoning petition that goes before council, there's always a conversation around schools overcrowding. 
I, I really truly believe that we should be addressing this and the development community should come to the table, in my opinion, to have this conversation with us as to if, if your development is going to negatively or significantly impact um, certain things that are very common like schools and parks or transit amenities, what can we do together to make sure that you are part of the um, you know, solution uh, rather than not just develop something that will create overcrowding or, or, or you know, make sure that, we, I mean, give us less open spaces. But I also believe that as we consider that though is, we also have to be careful that we're looking at potential impact on affordable housing. Uh, you know, so it, it, it's a balance and it's something that we're looking at right now, at least that I am pulling together a group to take a good look at that and what exactly does that mean for Charlotte. There are advantages and there are disadvantages. But one thing that I believe we can all agree on is that if you're developing in our city, then you've got to be part of the solution in terms of what will help our residents. Great. Um, our next question is from Will. He says, expanding on the idea of turning streets into plaza, has any thought been given to turning all of MLK Boulevard into a plaza? For reference, MLK Boulevard connects the Knight Stadium, Romare Bearden Park, NASCAR Hall of Fame, the Convention Center, Stone Stonewall Light Rail Station, and Marshall Park. That, that's, um, so there is, uh, I, I mentioned uh, in the All In 2040 Center City Plan, uh, I talked about um, nine focus areas. One of those focus areas is also along this particular area as well. How do you create an entertainment, a sports and entertainment area here? Um, that could actually help to, um, you know, reduce, um, you know, auto auto centric activities and rather encourage pedestrian activities more. Uh, so we're still working through that. You know, I go back to my original answer in terms of uh, creating plazas. You still have to engage people a lot because at the end of the day, there are people who live here who do business there. And we just have to understand that this is also a neighborhood, and so as we do it long term and as we also do additional streets, I want us to be mindful of, of that, that we would like to do all these things, but we definitely want to make sure that we bring uh, people along as well. Yeah. Um, well, in the interest of time, we'll ask one more question and then we'll move on. Um, so the last question is from Cam. Um, the question is, when are we going to make the square a square? not a closed plaza, but a place that truly ties the four corners together as the heart of Uptown. Progress is happening on all four corners, but we need the glue. I know that is a conversation going on around that right now. And, um, you know, with regards to what happens in this square. Uh, and I think that that's a conversation beyond even here right now, but I think that if everything comes together, the way it's envisioned, it will achieve exactly uh, what that question is trying to um, answer in terms of creating a place that's protected, that's, that has definite boundaries, but that also is an avenue for people to gather in one spot. Mm -hmm. Great. We do have one more question I want to ask um, for Julie, actually, since we've been making Taiwo do all the talking. <laughs> um, but um, Julie, this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, the question is, has any thought been given to giving the public a chance to comment during council, city, count, during council committee meetings? Zoom is such a user-friendly tool for such a purpose. Um, we, haven't, we haven't talked about that. Honestly, I, um, we have very few opportunities that council members can work together on topics, on making policy, that that's really where it happens is in the council meeting, uh, in the committee meetings, because we can have five of us, which doesn't constitute the majority. And that's where it's really the opportunity for the council members on that committee to kind of hash through the issues. Um, most of us stay, you know, are usually available before or after um, to take questions or to forward concerns that people have. And I, I, I just question how much we would be able to get done um, during the committee meeting if we were taking questions from participants. Um, we also do town halls really for that purpose as well. So if, if people feel like they don't have enough opportunity to ask questions, then it's always a great opportunity to suggest that one of us have a town hall on the topic. I'm always, ha I'm always open to suggestions for town halls. Great. 
Well, thank you everyone for your questions. Um, and Meg, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah Ann, for moderating and Taiwo and Julie for answering and all of the attendees for submitting such thoughtful questions. That last question also got me thinking about the, how things are so different now that we're engaging virtually and those those meetings that were just your know, little connections that would naturally happen at the beginning and, and ends of meetings can't happen as easily in the digital space. So we, we would love to explore more opportunities for connecting elected officials and city staff with the public through online the online mediums and uh, you know by phone. So thank you so much for for continuing to engage, even though we we can't meet in person. We just have a couple quick announcements, and we'll have have everything wrapped up by six o'clock. One really exciting opportunity that we have available to everyone who's listening, and everybody who you may want to share this information with. If you're interested in learning more about smart growth, complete streets, and how we can create space on our streets to transform them into places that work for all people, the importance of active transportation, how we can form partnerships, how we can implement com complete streets, we are hosting with Rayo Community Health through their REACH grant from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, a really in-depth four-part series of smart growth workshops. These are gonna be on consecutive Tuesday and Thursday afternoons from July 21st through 30th from 2 to 4 p.m. We had an announcement in our recent newsletter, so if you get that, the link is in there. And uh, don't feel like you need to write down this link because you'll be getting a follow-up email if you registered for today's event that will have this information in it tomorrow. So we would love for you to attend those. They're really meant for anyone who wants a deeper understanding of smart growth. So whether you are hearing about smart growth and transportation for the first time, or whether you've been in the planning field for years and you just want some better ideas for how to implement uh, smart growth, these are for you. And they're, they're being taught by facilitators from Smart Growth America, which is really the nationally uh, recognized expert organization uh, on smart growth issues. So we'd love for you to register. We do ask that you register ahead of time. There's no cost to attend and it's, it's definitely gonna be a valuable conversation as more people in Charlotte learn about how to effectively talk to their city staff and elected officials about smart growth issues. And now I'd like to introduce Mary Catherine from the Sustain Charlotte team. If you find these types of events valuable and you want to see more of them in the future, she's going to share with you a few ways that you can help to support Sustain Charlotte. Everyone, um, as Meg said, I am Mary Catherine Freeman and I am the development associate here at Sustain Charlotte. And um, really uh, in order for Sustain Charlotte to continue to advocate and educate and enact change in our community. We really depend on the support of people like you guys. Um, you know, we, we just simply wouldn't be able to do the work we do without the help of our community and from our donors. So just wanted to highlight really quickly um, ways that you guys can um, help us continue to advocate for safer streets um, and walkability here in Charlotte. Um, One-time donations are always obviously very much welcome, but we'd also really like to invite you guys to become members. Um, Sustain Charlotte has member pro membership programs starting at $5 a month or $60 a year, and there's various benefits going up to um, our $100 premium membership level, $100 a month. So I would really encourage you guys to check out our website and see if that's something that you are capable of supporting us through. Um, maybe you as an individual aren't capable of giving, but you think that your company or organization might be interested. Um, we also have a partnership program for corporate partners. Um, and we would love for you to give us a shout um, to your to your employers and see if it's something that they'd be interested in partnering with us on how to make Charlotte a safer, more equitable, um, healthier city for all people. Um, lastly, employee match giving programs are off, often available um, through different um, through different employers and different companies. So I'd encourage you to check that out. And um, one final note, we are launching our summer fundraising campaign together. We are Charlotte on Monday the 13th. So in just a couple days, we're really excited about this. Um, as a result of the impact of 
COVID-19, you know, I think all of us are um, feeling, feeling that financial impact. And so now more than ever, we could use your support. We could use your, um, use your resources and use your action um, on our behalf. So uh, just a little shout out. If you want to learn more, we encourage you to follow that hashtag together. We are Charlotte. Check out our website and our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter pages. Thanks, guys. Back to you, Meg. Okay, thanks, Mary Catherine. We just want to, again, ex express our gratitude to everyone who supports the work that we do here at Sustain Charlotte in any way that you, you share, whether it's through your financial resources, volunteering, advocating, helping to spread the word about the, the work that needs to be done. So everybody plays their role, and we're very grateful for every one of you. Please... Uh, Join me I'm just virtually in your heart in thanking Taiwo and Julie for joining us tonight. We, we're really grateful for them sharing their passion and their expertise. And we will be back with you soon. We're currently planning our next workshop and we'll have uh, another exciting topic that will be action oriented and very informative. So keep an eye on your email and social media and we'll have some updates soon. So thank you and have a great evening.